everyone. On today's podcast, we're going to talk about updated research evidence on doulas. Welcome to the Evidence-Based Birth Podcast. My name is Rebecca Decker, and I'm a nurse with my PhD and the founder of Evidence-Based Birth. Join me each week as we work together to get evidence-based information into the hands of families and professionals around the world. As a reminder, this information is not medical advice. See evbirth.com slash disclaimer for more details. Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's episode of the Evidence-Based Birth Podcast. My name is Dr. Rebecca Decker, pronouns she, her, and I'm a nurse with my PhD and the founder of Evidence-Based Birth. Today, I will be co-hosting today's episode along with our research editors at EBB, Ihotu Ali, MPH, and Aaron Wilson, MPH. Today's episode is very special because we are going to share with you the private audio and video from a live stream we did with our pro members here at EBB. In this live stream, our research team discussed three major topics related to updated research evidence on doulas. We talked about the research on the pandemic's effect on the doula profession, research on the difference between community-based doulas and private or traditional doulas, and new info on paying or getting reimbursement for doula care in the United States. This podcast is also being posted on our YouTube channel in case you want to access the video of us and the screen share of some of the evidence that we're going to talk about. As a content note, this episode includes discussion of COVID-19, racism, and how a lack of Medicaid postpartum coverage is in some cases tied to the same places that have abortion bans. Before I get started, I'd like to introduce the two people who will be co-teaching today's episode alongside me. Ihotu Ali, pronouns she, her, is a doula, Maya abdominal massage therapist, doctoral student in chiropractic medicine, and a research editor at EBB. Ihotu, meaning love in the Idoma language, is the granddaughter of a traditional Nigerian chief, of Polish-Irish farmers, and a graduate of Columbia University. Ihotu has conducted maternal health research with the United Nations before becoming a doula in 2011. Fascinated by the connections between Western and traditional medicine, Ihotu spent a decade studying in Afro-Indigenous and global cultural practices for childbirth and ancestral and wound healing. Ihotu is now alongside medical training and chiropractic care, studying the neuroscience of spirituality and meditation. Ihotu is a co-founder of the Minnesota Healing Justice Network, which was featured in Rolling Stone magazine for their focus on rest for residents and healers through the 2020 uprising. And Ihotu is also now the director of the Oshun Center for Intercultural Healing. Erin Wilson, pronouns she, her, is a clinical researcher who's also a doula and childbirth educator. Erin has an undergraduate degree in biology, a minor in English, and a master's in public health. Erin currently lives with her family in a rural area in the mountains of Colorado, which has given her more time to spend with her daughter, Evelyn. Erin brought her unique skills to work with us on the research team, joining us as a research editor in June 2021. Erin also teaches virtual perinatal education classes and works with local nonprofits to work on lowering the cesarean rate. Over the past few years, Erin has focused from one-on-one -on -one birth work to a more policy-level change. Her overarching goal is to make quality healthcare and health education more accessible for all. Erin has long appreciated and referenced the work we do at EBB, and now she's involved daily in furthering our work of publishing clear, evidence-based scientific education. So now I'm going to take you to the recording that we did about the updated research evidence on doulas. So welcome, everyone. <laughs> We've got the EBB research team here to talk with you about new research and news related to doulas, which I know many of you are interested in because so many of our members are doulas. So I have with me Aaron Wilson and Ihotu Ali, our two research team members along with me. Um, they're both our research editors at EBB, and we recently published a newsletter all about the research on doulas, like new research, and we wanted to go over that. So Erin, what were we going to talk about first? Well, I can start with the insurance changes if you want. We're going to kind of go over the main topics that we did in that newsletter. So community-based and private doulas and some expanded Medicare and Medicaid coverage. And Rebecca's going to talk about doulas in the pandemic. 
Okay. Right? Well, let's save payment for last because I think that's Sounds a little good. bit. Yeah. Why don't that's, I go? That's advanced. <laughs> okay. Yeah. That's a, an advanced topic, pay, payment for doulas and reimbursement for doulas. Yeah. So why don't I start with the pandemic research and then we'll have Iho to talk about community-based doulas and then we'll move on to like funding all of these wonderful doula care. So let's talk about COVID-19 and doulas around the world. I know many people feel like, well, the pandemic is sort of over, sort of not. Whatever side you fall on, I think we're still talking about how the pandemic affects doulas because it had such a big impact on the doula profession. And we're talking about several years of turbulence in the profession in terms of a lot of our doulas, first of all, actually saw their businesses increase or their practices increase, which was a little bit of a surprise, I think, because we were thinking, well, it'll make it harder to do in-person support. But instead, what we saw is families around the world were more anxious. And so a lot of how they addressed that was by hiring doulas. So we saw that among our members and the doulas we work with. And then it also had a huge impact because of the doula's presence, not always being physically welcome in hospitals anymore. So we looked at a couple studies. There was a survey done in early 2020 in the early days of the academic, looking at the experiences of more than 500 doulas across 23 countries. And in the US, they looked at 42 states and the impact of the pandemic on doula support. This was a qualitative study. So they were looking at the answers to open-ended questions and they primarily recruited through various Facebook doula groups. And they were trying to get representation from both private and community-based doulas, which Ihote is going to talk more about that in a little bit. And then they went back in the summer of 2020 and followed back up with some of the doulas to find out how their experiences were changing. And what the researchers found is that around the entire globe, there was an almost universal restriction of doulas and hospitals in the early days of the pandemic and the first summer of the pandemic. And in some locations, sometimes parents would have to choose between their doula and their partner, but in most places, they were not allowed to have both. Unless you're giving birth at a freestanding birth center or a home birth, in which cases most of the time you could have a doula and a partner. And so doulas really had to rush to kind of re-envision their services. So a lot of them added virtual support and they would do in-person support if it was possible or virtual support if it was not. And they started really training partners more. So a big role of the doula evolved into prenatal training of the partner or partners to support the birthing person. But doulas had a lot of anxieties during this time. They were really worried about whether or not virtual support was effective. They were also really worried about being labeled as non-essential. Would that be mean that they're taken less seriously? And they also had a huge concern with increasing rates of obstetric violence. So doulas around the world noted in their interviews and answers to open-ended questions that they were seeing, they were hearing from their clients about higher rates of obstetric violence, and the doulas could not be there to buffer that or provide a barrier to that or witness to that. And a lot of doulas had just before the pandemic finally started finding a little bit of acceptance in hospitals. And then being kicked out so quickly was really discouraging because they felt really devalued. And then it created the situation where in some hospitals, the doulas two years later still have not been welcomed back. Now, in many places they have been, but in others, it's like the hospitals almost were looking for a way to like keep the doulas out. And so it became a good excuse to limit doula support. Often you think about the doula role, we talked about this before at EBB, how it tends to highlight almost more the deficiencies of hospital support, or I should say the lack of support you get in the hospital. So having the doula there is often like a very visible reminder of the fact that the hospital is not providing adequate emotional and physical support to laboring people. And so it can be a bit of a, I don't know how to say this, but doulas can almost be seen by hospitals as adversaries instead of a part of the team. And so the, the pandemic gave a really easy excuse to kick the doulas out. And some other themes in the research from this study were strain and emotional burnout and 
trying to also deal with the closure of schools and childcare and just not having enough support in their own families. And so this was a global phenomenon that affected many, many doulas. And I know things are changing again, but I think some of the things that we saw, some of those themes, and in, including an increased awareness of doulas, increased awareness of the fact that your partner may need a doula just as much as you in order to help teach them and coach them and support measures. And then also adding on this virtual component to both doula work and childbirth education. So that article was published by Julie Johnson Searcy and Angela Castaneda in the United States, and it was published in a journal article called Frontiers in Sociology. So I was wondering, I kind of alluded to community-based doulas and private doulas both being included in this research. If Ihotu, you could talk a little bit about community-based doulas and kind of how they're different from private doula. Yeah. So I started out as a community-based doula in New York City. I worked in Harlem and, you know, have seen the growth of community-based doulas around the country and, you know, perhaps globally. And in this really interesting way over the last 10 years, there's a beautiful report called Advancing Birth Justice, Community-Based Doula Models as a Standard of Care for Ending Racial Disparities. That's done by Bay et al. And we pulled from this report and kind of conversations amongst ourselves and with different community doulas to kind of come up with a chart that's in the research newsletter that breaks down the difference between community-based doulas and kind of t- traditional doula care. So I can say for myself as a doula, I went through the traditional doula training, which is about maybe 16 hours, a couple of days of training. I didn't get much opportunity for ongoing mentorship or that was kind of optional. And we covered the typical things, you know, we covered birth and we the stages of labor and we covered comfort measures and things like that. But then it was when I finished that training and I started working for a community-based organization in Harlem that I got all my extra training, which I would say community-based tools is like the traditional model plus, plus, plus. And then minus, minus, minus when it comes to the funding and how much money you get paid <laughs> for how much more work you're doing. So I remember being in Harlem and basically becoming like a social worker or being really sad that I hadn't gone to social work school because I needed those skills. The way we define it in the newsletter is community-based doulas are known, trusted, and skilled individuals, often from underserved communities, who are trained to provide culturally grounded prenatal birth and postpartum support. So there's a piece about culture here and being from the community that we're working with. And then we also hold roles as patient advocates and we are really kind of protecting and holding space for birthing people who are more likely to experience interpersonal and systemic racism through birth. So we're guiding people in birth, but we're also guiding them through a you know, racist and sexist system that is working against them on many levels. So people might need support with other things, housing and nutrition and emotional support through the process. So I always say, you know, for my years as a community doula, I was getting paid pennies, but I was like fed by the love of the work. You know, it was really powerful, impactful work. And I'm still close. You know, I still talk to some of those folks. And so, you know, I think what's really nice about this advancing birth justice report and other ones like it that have come out is talking about community-based doula care as different, requiring different training, requiring different, you know, funding streams. And then it's as a standard of care for ending racial disparities. So this is a tool in anti-racism work in the birth world, right? We can actually sustain because burnout is really high among community-based doulas. And I'd love for you to talk about sustainability in a minute, Iho, too, but I've seen a disturbing trend of the term community-based doula being kind of co-opted by many white doulas. So can you talk a little bit about, like, what are some more of the differences between a community-based doula and a traditional or private doula who practices in their community? Because I think that's one reason there's some confusion, because doulas do practice in their community. So- How can we like further distinguish those two? Yeah, there are people that offer sliding scale or volunteer births. And that's a little bit different because of 
are they from that community? Do they have a standing in that community? Are they already trusted even before they became a doula is one thing. So one thing about training, it's training can take place over several months and is considered full spectrum doula support. So it's also trauma informed. It might include how to support families from preconception all the way to postpartum and beyond, including human rights, anti-racism, birth justice, cultural practices around birth and postpartum healing, and then mentorship is often included in this, but certification might not be available or it might not be desired by these duels because of the limited kinds of certification bodies that we have or how expensive it is. Yes, so given how little I was paid as a community-based duel, it did not make sense for me to maintain my donor certification. I'll say that up front. It did not make any sense. <laughs> so yeah, so that's one difference. I would say for the training for traditional doulas, they're not getting trained on as much on advocacy. How racism plays a role specifically in the birth room, microaggressions to keep an eye out for, ways to respond to those microaggressions, how to protect your client. They're not getting that advanced level of advocacy training. And they're often following this independent entrepreneurial business model where you have a client privately hire you. And then as you go over more time and you, you know, accumulate more and more births, you've done 200, 300 births, you can make more and more money over time, right? And you will still have access to wealthy communities who will pay you those higher rates. Whereas community doulas, our folks are not really making more money over time. And so, you know, if we want to continue working community, we're not increasing our income over time. So that's hard for us in our career. And then I'll say that and increasingly, and this is good news, and this is also cautious optimism because there are issues around it, but you know, community programs and grants and Medicaid reimbursement is happening more and more for community doulas. The challenges around things like Medicaid reimbursement, and I can talk about this more later. We can talk about the case of Minnesota in particular, which is one of the first states, which is where I live now. It's my hometown. There are some strident requirements for certification. There are limitations on what training you did in order to certify. And ironically, some of those trainings you need to certify to get on, you know, registry lists to get reimbursed um, under Medicaid for seeing, you know, low-income clients don't include the additional training and the advocacy and the anti-racism work that we just talked about is really important. Yeah, I think the certification issue is is a big issue. And it's one reason a couple of years ago that I decided to no longer require certification for people to become an EBB instructor. Like you don't have to be certified and you don't have to keep your certification because I felt like that was gatekeeping and a barrier. So we took that away. But then as a, like kind of a leader in the birth world, I get random emails from time to time from people working on legislation or things. And I got some really disturbing emails over the last year or two from and messages from people who said they were working on legislation and they wanted to know if EBB has a dual certification. And they wanted to know because they wanted to put us on a list of approved certifications that could be, you know, would be on the list of, well, Medicaid will reimburse you if you have this certification or this certification, right? So you can and only imagine the kind of certifications that they were looking for. Mm -hmm. They were looking for not the type of training that you just spoke about. And that was alarming to me. So I would always respond, why are you requiring certification? This is not necessarily a part of community-based doulas. You're going to be disenfranchising all the doulas who are practicing in the community-based model who don't go through this certification model. And yeah, so I was trying my best to teach people as we went, but it was really alarming to me. So have you seen that as well in other communities? this like heavy emphasis on certification from um, organizations that don't necessarily provide the training, the well-rounded training you mentioned earlier. 1000%. Because of the more entrepreneurial model, there's more wealth sitting in those organizations. Let's be clear. They're also, you know, often white led organizations that might not even know all of the duos of color in the area. And not that all community-based duos are duos of color, but this is the main group that we're talking about. So those organizations are the ones that can go and lobby, right? So what we've seen in Minnesota is organizations that can go and lobby, say, hey, we would like, 
you know, Medicaid funding for doulas and because they have a relationship with the legislators, right? And they're well known, you know, kind of they have the website and they have kind of this standing in community. They say, okay, we'll take doulas that have trained with you or we'll take doulas that are on your registry or we'll take doulas, the case of Minnesota, we'll take doulas who are billing through one particular organization, right? That does not necessarily have relationships with all the doulas, right? And does not even have additional funding to handle billing as an extra project for all of these doulas, right? And we know healthcare, billing is not easy. That's a whole nother thing that we can talk about. So the effort is good. We need more people who are experienced community-based doulas at the table in those conversations, meeting the legislators, building their relationship with the legislators, understanding how do we build directly to doulas? How do we empower doulas with their own NPIs rather than just the white-led organizations that have the money to kind of distribute it as they, you know, the best that they're able to based on their own relationships and their time and their interests. This is not necessarily their community either, right? For us, this is, these are our friends, these are our families, these are our colleagues. At the end of the day, we don't sleep if our people are not having support at their births, right? Other folks can sleep when it's not their problem. I just wanted to say, Ihotu and I have talked about this offline, but I think this problem of the certification or being trained by a specific organization, I think it's pretty widespread even outside of community doulas because the hospital program that I worked for many years ago, you had to be trained by I mean, their requirement was not that you were certified, but who you were trained by. And then they even had a list of these organizations do not qualify. And I mean, this was a long time ago, so there were less dual training programs than there are now, and it was already so limited. So I think it's a pretty widespread problem. And I think we have to call that out is like gatekeeping is part of white supremacy culture and it's happening in organizations. I will say COPE training, Jenny Joseph's training is really getting up there. And so that is one that has really built relationships and that is allowed, I believe in Minnesota. And then there's also, if anyone from Minnesota is watching, you know, like our groundswing of black birth workers here, including Rhonda Fellows, you know, Rhonda Fellows teaches. And so, you know, we're in the process of trying to get more trainings of different doula classes on the list. So one thing you can do if you're working on legislation, you know, in your state, because there's a lot of states, I think it's like 26 states now are making progress toward this, is just make sure that the right people are in the room, you know, make sure you have the relationships with community-based doulas if you're going for Medicaid reimbursement. And that was one thing I noticed in my state of Kentucky a couple of years ago, somebody was talking about the Medicaid reimbursement for doulas. I was like, do you have any, any doulas of color at the table? You know, I think the answer was no at the time. And it was like, okay, you need to go do some work before you start proposing legislation. Um, Aaron, do you want to talk a little bit while we're talking about payment for doulas? Like, I guess we could talk about it from a couple of different perspectives. There's the whole Medicaid issue, and then there's paying for doulas like privately out of pocket. Can you talk about some of those different options? Yeah, sure. So I'll talk a little bit about NPI numbers because Iho2 just mentioned that. And I think it's a good thing to bring up really for any doula that you can go on the Medicare and Medicaid services website, the CMS website, and you can apply for an NPI, which is a national provider identification. And you don't have to be a certified doula in order to fill out that application, but you will enter in different fields like when were you trained, information about births that you've been to and your experiences. And I think like Ihotu kind of mentioned, it is a really valuable tool for like having some autonomy and saying, I'm a provider. These are the services that I'm doing. And just like one piece of the toolkit that you would have to go to seek reimbursement. And then just to get like a little bit into the alphabet soup of billing, <laughs> I won't go too far into it as I don't want to cause people to drop off of this Facebook Live, but there are some codes that once you kind of wrap your head around what they are, they can be really useful in seeking insurance coverage or insurance reimbursement. So we already talked about NPI, that's the first alphabet soup. The second one that I wanna bring up is a CPT code, and that's just some medical billing speak for, it actually stands for current procedural terminology, which doesn't really matter, it just means what are you doing? <laughs> Who are you? What is the procedure or the thing that you're helping with? And so 
much to my joy, many years ago, I found out that there is a CPT code that just means continuous labor support. So doulas, even if we're feeling down on ourselves, we are actually recognized in medical billing terminology, right? We have a CPT code and I'll just say what it is. It's 99499. And that actually stands for continuous labor support. So this can be a really helpful thing to know. You can include it in a letter to an insurance company to try to get coverage or reimbursement. A midwife or an OB can include it in your client's medical record to talk about that it's something that you're recommending. And so I'll just give an example of like how that could happen. So I'm going to throw in one more alphabet soup and it's an ICD-9 code and you don't have to exactly remember that, but it's a diagnosis code. So there's a code for any type of diagnosis that you could get in a healthcare setting. And so an example could be a care provider or you as a doula could write a letter saying, I'm working with a client or a patient that has gestational diabetes or has type one diabetes. I'm just using this as an example. So you could use a diagnosis code. There's a separate one for gestational diabetes, and there's also one for diabetes mellitus. So just as an example, you could say this client or patient of mine has diabetes. If they do not go into labor on their own, they will be induced at 39 weeks as standard of care. If they have an induction, there's a potential for their labor to be much longer, a prolonged labor. It could be really helpful for them to have extra labor support in the form of a doula, continuous labor support. 99499. <laughs> so putting in both of those codes could be really helpful to really explain like, who are you? <laughs> What's happening with you that maybe it could be a good idea for you to have extra labor support? And then what type of labor support are we recommending for you? So both of those codes can be really helpful. And obviously diabetes and induction is just a random example, but sometimes I would even take what happened. So coming from like doula of the future, the birth has already happened. What happened? What codes could we use from what has already happened to show how our role was extra valuable? And so this is just obviously a specific example. We all know that doulas can be helpful in many other situations outside of the one that I've just explained, but this is just for the sake of example of how you could show your worth. And another thing that I think is extra important is really to talk about in your letter that doulas are proven to be beneficial in labor. So you could cite our EBB article about doulas. You could cite a lot of different studies showing, you know, why we're awesome, why we deserve to be there and why we deserve to be paid a fair living wage. So this is something you could use when you're writing to like an insurance company to request reimbursement? Yes, exactly. Okay. Sorry if I didn't make that clear. But yeah. yeah, I would kind of weave all of that into a letter, either asking for reimbursement after the fact or asking for coverage up front before you've provided your services. I think all of this can be really helpful. Throw some medical billing jargon in there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and does one of you want to talk about like the Medicaid ex extension? Because so many pregnancies in the United States are covered by Medicaid. And what impact is that going to have on doulas getting reimbursement for their services? Which one of you wants to take that? I was just going to say on the private, you know, commercial reimbursement side of things, there are some interesting things happening in Minnesota, like Target Corporation is offering its employees a form that they can submit to Target, to the insurance company, I'm not sure, to cover up to $2,000 in doula care. But there's a problem with the form. And so it's like the right people haven't talked to each other. So they ask for an MPI number and they ask for billing things that we don't have. And so it's just interesting that people are trying to make moves and individual corporations are getting into this game too. But I think there's- As like a benefit for their employees. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Like maternity leave and doula care is, you know, mm -hmm. often. Yeah. But it's been really hard to actually operationalize. Doulas aren't getting paid through it yet because of like the logistics of the form. Okay. I was going to say, I'll talk about what we covered in the newsletter, which is this expansion. And then Ihotu, maybe if you want to chime back in on like how that could be problematic sometimes, it's kind of what you already said, but I think it's like a good tie in. So I'll just say two big things happened on April 1st, and we covered this in more detail in the newsletter, but on April 1st, just recently, these two expansions occurred. So the first one is that Medicare and Medicaid extended healthcare coverage and states have to opt into this to be clear. So like everyone doesn't have this already, but they gave the option for states to extend healthcare coverage for 12 months of continuous postpartum care. So we all know that like this one postpartum visit at six weeks 
is woefully inadequate. So the idea here is it's this 12 month continuous spectrum where people can seek postpartum care. And this also includes the babies that are born under the Children's Health Insurance Program or CHIP. So this is a five-year program. And if a state opts in, then they, they need to include all eligible individuals that were either enrolled in Medicaid or enrolled in the Children's Health Care Program. And anybody that's given birth in the last 12 months is also eligible. So if you've already given birth four months ago, you're now eligible for this additional eight months of postpartum coverage. So in theory, this is great. We're cautiously optimistic. The other thing that happened on the same day is the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. They announced the availability of this big grant, $4.5 million, and it's all for the hiring, training, certifying, and compensating of community-based doulas. And so, Yoto, I don't want to put you on the spot, but like, I thought that's maybe where you could talk about a little bit about like, how does this actually impact doulas or how could this actually impact doulas in a meaningful way? Or we can cover that in the next phase. <laughs> <laughs> and it looks like, I mean, at the time of we're recording this, already half of the U.S. states have said they're going to. I was going to yes. ask. Which yeah. yeah. Which yeah. states? Well, I want to know which states, right? Is it the states that already have really good kind of safety net care already? Or like, those that don't have good Medicaid coverage now don't have good postpartum Medicaid coverage as well. That would be the first question I would ask. I mean, I think it's really important. We know that so many maternal deaths happen in the postpartum period. And postpartum is such a complicated, hard time for a lot of people, especially if you're on Medicaid, right? So this is really important. And we had Monica McLemore and Jamila Taylor, you know, advocating for it, come on the EB podcast maybe a couple months ago and advocated for this. And so I'm really happy that's passed. And I think it's, I'm curious if there's any advocacy that we as birth workers can do on a legislative or state level to push those states who haven't adopted it to do so. Erin, do you want to read the list of states as of our... Yeah, our, I was just going to say, I was just looking for that. There's this nice graphic that maybe we could put up that shows the states that have adopted and implemented and then the states that have not adopted. It's a lot of states. It's 39 states, including DC, that have opted in. So maybe it's actually easier to say the states that have not opted in, if that's okay. So yeah. it'd be a good geography test. Okay, <laughs> here's some states that have not opted in. All the other ones have. Wyoming, South Dakota... Wisconsin, Kansas, Texas, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, Florida, Tennessee, and both of the Carolinas are the 11 states that have not opted in. My first question was going to be, what about the Southern states? I'm just relieved that I just knew all the states on that map. <laughs> I need to process that. Well, they won't label. Yeah. You just did my state <laughs> Right. The southern states, no, have not opted in. <laughs> yes. Most, yes. in most part. And correlation to abortion bans and low rates of midwives and not having certifications or licensing for midwives. A lot of those states, like Alabama, Georgia, yeah. I'm surprised about Wisconsin. I need to go next door and <laughs> start talking to somebody. <laughs> One of my concerns, I mean, it's great. I think that this is going to be a lot of money infused to community-based doula trainings. But I guess one of my concerns is that the money will, again, be like co-opted by white-led organizations. And I think we just need to be really cautious and advocating for any organizations that we're part of that this funding should go to the actual community-based doula training programs, as you know, Ihoti was describing earlier, what those are and what they mean and how they're embedded in the communities that they serve. So it'll be interesting to see like because whenever there's a mass infusion of money, it's a good thing. It's a good sign. But it's also, for me, my alert button goes up because I think of like how people could be like, who are not part of this will be like, oh, money for us. So we'll right. go snag that out of the air and take that for our people, you know? Well, and the way that I see it too is the systemic restrictions, the white supremacy, just things about our culture where we're thinking more about me than we're thinking about how to spread this equally around to those who need it the most, even if I don't know who they are, even if I don't like, they still might need it more than I need it. And so those restrictions are at the top all the way down and then all the way at the bottom. Right. And so you bring money into the top, but it's going to still get bottlenecked at all these other restrictions coming down. So, you know, this is long-term work. This is lifelong work. Right. And I think it's good to have that money infusion, but now we got to make sure 
that we keep working. And everybody's hopefully, you know, doing our work at different places all along that pathway. I can speak for, you know, Minnesota after the murder of George Floyd in 2020, there was a ton of money that came here. And I will just say a lot of it got bottlenecked and it did not end up in the hands of people directly because of grants, requirements, and certifications, and all the logistics that we put around money. Ihotu, could you talk a little bit about, like, what are some ways that people can find community-based doulas if they're looking for one or they're trying to figure out who the community-based doulas are near them? Yeah, I think there are, you know, some websites that do have Black and Brown doulas featured, I would love to see websites also. I want to shout out to poor white folks, to rural folks, right? To indigenous folks. Like there's many different groups that need community-based doula care. But it is very hard to find us online. Online, you know, can be a little bit of a more privileged space um, for business owners and like established businesses that have checked all the boxes. So I would say relationships is really the best way to get the most grassroots. A lot of those, you know, I will shout out Sister Midwife Productions, which is a great site that if you're a Black doula or midwife, you can be listed on that site absolutely for free. That is fantastic. A lot of the other Black and folks of color, you know, birth worker sites do require some kind of a fee to varying degrees. And so that's a little bit harder for us to join. Um, given, as I was explained, we have low income anyways. And then also you're not going to find folks on there because folks aren't going on there. So I would recommend finding the midwives in your community, the wellness spaces in your community. Folks are doing things if you look. So you might find a yoga teacher, you might find energy worker, you might find an artist, right? Who through their own personal connections knows who's doing what and can find folks in community. A lot of folks here in Minnesota are on Instagram um, and are on social media, but might not have a you know full website and be listed on these sites. So I think it's relationship work, right? You can't just transactionally look up black doulas in Minnesota and they'll all pop up. Like you, some of them will pop up, but the more privileged ones will pop up. So keep looking after that too. And ask one person, who else they recommend you ask? What's that? The snowballing method of interviewing. Ask one person who else and then ask those people who else and ask those people who else. And I will say on the EBB website, there are a list of many birth justice organizations across all 50 states in the United States. So that's a good place to begin. We often know each other. So once you find one of us, you find the group. I also wanted to say, you know, that there are a lot of creative ways people are funding doula care while they're waiting for kind of society in general to start paying doulas. And there's a couple we mentioned in our newsletter. There's the Hello 7 Doula Fund for Black families. And there are just so many different amazing nonprofit doula agencies like Gals in Texas, Health Connect One in Chicago. Ancient Song Doula Services in New York City, the By My Side program in New York City, the Frontline Doulas in Los Angeles, there's Hope's Embrace in Kentucky near me, and there's other programs or individual doulas who keep a pool of funding available for low-income families through grants and private donations, or perhaps they ask their more privileged clients to pay a little bit above their normal price so that they can fund people who can't afford doula care. So. There's definitely ways to be creative, and we're really excited about all of the organizations that are doing that work, and hopefully some of that funding will reach them as well, those, like, organizations on the ground. I do say I keep an eye on, like, you know, that you talk about these large donations that are some coming from some of our billionaires in the U.S., and I keep going and looking at, like, Mackenzie Scott, and she publishes the names of, like, with their permission – And I think I've only seen like one Black maternal health organization receive a donation out of the many hundreds, if not thousands of places. And I just feel like I'm still waiting for philanthropists to like figure out that these dual organizations on the ground in communities are doing incredible work with families and it's not being like shown or appreciated at like these levels of philanthropy. I'm surprised by that, mm-hmm. especially with Jenny Joseph being, you know, time know. 
you know, one of the year. I wonder if that might come in the next year. I hope. If anyone I hope. That's why I'm saying it out loud. Here. I'm manifesting it. I want to see like every doula and midwife organization led by birth workers of color just get infused with money from some, you know, billionaire who decides to pay attention finally. So, because it affects the whole family, you know, when you provide doula support or midwife support to people who come from a community that's been targeted and marginalized, a doula from their own community or a midwife from their own community can make all the difference in how they start parenthood and that right. journey of raising their children. Right. Well, and there's that famous, you know, slightly controversial study or just intriguing study by Greenwood et al. that also Dr. Rachel Hardiman is on about how infants who are receiving care from a white doctor are more likely to die than if they- Black were infants. Black yeah. Infants, right. Mm -hmm. Than if they have a Black doctor. And so- Racial concordance, this idea that you, Black people can receive more quality care from Black doctors is something that's becoming more in conversation. And why is that, right? It's like, well, are they, they're trained the same way, right? But you feel more comfortable if for whatever reason, if race is the connecting point, there might be other connecting points, gender, right? Where you come from in the country, but your language, your culture, but... If race is one connecting point and you feel more comfortable as a patient to talk to honestly the doctor, what's really going on, you're getting a better clinical picture, the doctor's paying more attention. I've seen studies that black doctors are taking more notes on black patients versus white doctors notes on black patients are shorter and just more terse and there wasn't more conversation and they're not getting the whole picture so i think it trickles down into doula care too we, it's really sensitive work you're all up in someone's business <laughs> in a really sensitive time and when you feel comfortable and you can really build a deep relationship with someone who gets you who's not looking down on you who's not judging you for the way you decided to birth or how you sleep with your child or you know decisions around breastfeeding and chest feeding that's huge that means that person who feels safe can like really relax and your nervous system can settle and you don't have high blood pressure i mean it's just doulas are very powerful you know from doulas all the way into all of the healthcare settings we're in the business of trying to make people feel safe so i think you know, the money will come. <laughs> Mackenzie Scott. <laughs> well, thank you, Erin and Nihotu for coming on and talk with me about the research and the info you were collecting that past month. And I appreciate you sharing so much. And to our listeners, I hope you've enjoyed and learned something new today. Thanks, everyone. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank Bye. You. Bye. Today's podcast was brought to you by the Evidence-Based Birth Professional Membership. The free articles and podcasts we provide to the public are supported by our professional membership program at Evidence-Based Birth. Our members are professionals in the childbirth field who are committed to being change agents in their community. Professional members at EBB get access to continuing education courses with up to 23 contact hours, live monthly training sessions, an exclusive library of printer-friendly PDFs to share with your clients, and a supportive community for asking questions and sharing challenges, struggles, and success stories. We offer monthly and annual plans, as well as scholarships for students and for people of color. To learn more, visit ebbirth.com membership.